Um, the title of this talk is Choosing Systemic Therapy for Metastatic Hormone Sensitive Prostate Cancer. And then big picture in this talk, I'm going to be trying to describe how I choose uh, ADT um, when I use an agonist versus an antagonist, and then also how I choose among the four available androgen signaling inhibitors. All right, here's my conflict of interest statement. So the prognosis for men with newly diagnosed metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer is favorable. Median overall survival from the SWOG, recent SWOG study was greater than six years in both tr treatment arms. And this is with Orteranel, which is not an FDA approved regimen. Um, so you can anticipate it could be even better without uh, or with modern regimens. And then given the advanced age at diagnosis of metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer and the prolonged survival that we're seeing, men with metastatic hormone sensitive disease are at increased risk for non-cancer related mortality compared to other malignancies. And this second figure comes from a SEER study. And in that study, about 20% of patients um, ended up dying of non-cancer related conditions. And you can see that as the time from diagnosis um, increased, the um, risk for dying from uh, cardiovascular disease and other non-cancer related conditions increased as well. So there's a need to consider the whole patient when we're selecting treatment for men with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. So when I'm first meeting a man with metastatic hormone sensitive disease, I'm trying to characterize the disease. Some of that's clinical criteria, things such as is this de novo metastatic versus um, metastatic disease after prior local therapy and also volume of disease. And this high volume versus low volume comes from the conventional imaging era um, and was defined initially in the charted trial. But what you can see in this first Kaplan-Meier figure is just the idea that patients with um, low volume disease after prior local therapy have much better outcomes than those with high volume disease and de novo presentation. And that does influence how I approach the disease. Um, I also try to characterize the disease molecularly. That's looking at germline DNA. For germline DNA, I'm looking for things such as a BRCA alteration or pathogenic variant, ATM, or any other pathogenic variants that may influence outcomes. Um, for somatic DNA, I prefer doing it on tumor tissue if I can, but especially in patients with high volume disease, you can also do it um, with liquid biopsy. What I'm looking for with somatic DNA next generation sequencing are things such as the aggressive variant uh, molecular signature, which would be two out of any three of these alterations here, TP53, RB1, or P10 loss, or looking for a somatic BRCA alteration. All of these would portend a poor prognosis and um, get me to consider further intensifying therapy. Um, and then um, also looking at expression of uh, cell surface protein markers such as PSMA um, and or FDG, but in all honesty, I don't get a lot of FDG pets, um, particularly in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. And then um, we also take all of this into consideration with other clinical criteria looking for um, uh, clinical aggressive variant prostate cancer. Um, this is from a 2013 paper published by our group, Dr. Ap Ana Aparicio. Um, but just to give you an idea of what a clinical aggressive variant prostate cancer can look like, is these are going to be patients with exclusively visceral metastases, small cell, um, predominantly lytic lesions, bulky primaries, um, very low PSAs for a high volume of disease. Um, or patients who have um, CEAs or LDHs greater than 2x the upper limit of normal. So I'm also checking CEAs and LDHs pretty routinely in my patients. And then one thing is I'm not going to touch up, I know the next talk um, is going to be looking at doublet versus triplet, so I'm not going to dive into triplet therapy um, at all or how I choose patients for that. So the standard of care for men with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer is a doublet with a GnRH agonist plus an androgen signaling inhibitor. Um, and that's shown here in this red box. Um, the options, if you're just doing a doublet, are going to be to combine with uh, ADT with abiraterone, apalutamide, or enzalutamide. Um, if you're considering doing a triplet, um, you can also use um, darolutamide uh, in that situation or use abiraterone. And I think one key takeaway from this slide and from my whole talk is that there's really not much of a role for ADT monotherapy anymore for patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, nor when you look at this slide, is there much of a role for ADT plus docetaxel without an androgen signaling inhibitor.
so how do I choose an, an LHRH analog? Um, I think most people here know we have GNRH agonists such as Luprolide, Gosarelin, or Triptorelin. We also have GNRH antagonists such as Degarelix or Relugolix. Um, when you're trying to think between Degarelix and Relugolix, you're thinking subcutaneous versus oral dosing. Um, and then also, what's the half-life for testosterone recovery to differentiate these two? You have a quicker half-life for testosterone recovery with Relugolix. So when do I favor using an, an antagonist? Um, if a patient has a primary in place, especially now that we're using these androgen signaling inhibitors in almost all patients, I, I don't use bicalutamide for the testosterone flare. I give them a dose of Degarelix if the primary is in place, and then I transition to Luprolide um, a month later. During that month, I have the opportunity to get germline sequencing and somatic sequencing as well. Um, if I have concerns about uh, tolerability due to frailty, I'll also favor antagonists in some of those patients just due to the quicker um, testosterone recovery. And then the final one, importantly, is cardiovascular disease. And this isn't just cardiovascular risk factors. This is actual, you've had a stent placed or you've had a cabbage done in the past. So that leads into kind of, well, what's the data on cardiovascular disease and GnRH analogs? Is there really a difference between antagonist and agonist? Um, in my interpretation of the liter literature, I think there's a slight difference favoring GnRH antagonist, um, and they may have lower cardiovascular events than agonist. There's been a lot of retrospective real-world data that's all pointed that way. And then um, more recently, we had the HERO trial that looked at relugolix versus luprolide, and that study, relugolix had a um, significantly lower hazard for major adverse cardiovascular events than uh, luprolide did. But a key point, and I think Dr. Klotz brought this up, is that um, is the pronounced trial. And the point of the pronounced trial, in my mind, is that appropriate cardiovascular care is more important than whether you choose an, an agonist or an antagonist here. The pronounced trial looked, uh, was planning to randomize 900 men to Degarelix versus Luprolide. Um, it was stopped after 545 patients were enrolled, and there were only 26 um, cardiovascular events in those 545 patients. And I think instead of saying, well, the incidence is just lower than we think, it's that all of these patients were plugged into a cardiologist mitigating risk factors from initiation of hormone therapy, or at least enrollment in the pronounced trial. And that's really different than what most of our clinical practices look like. Uh, so then, again, androgen signaling inhibitors, what are our options for metastatic hormone-sensitive disease? If you're doing it as a doublet, it's abiraterone, apalutamide, or enzalutamide. If you're doing it as a triplet, abiraterone or darilutamide are your options here. So now I'm going I'm to run through briefly the data that supports each of these um, options for doublet, and then um, how I go about choosing which to use. I use all of these androgen signaling inhibitors in my clinic. There's not only one that I use. So for abiraterone and the data to support it as a doublet, it comes from two studies, the LATITUDE trial and the STAMPEDE trial. Um, the LATITUDE trial randomized about 1,200 patients to ADT plus or minus abiraterone, um, and it significantly reduced the hazard for death by 35%, which you can see in this Kaplan-Meier figure here, or 34%. Um, and I think what you'll see in a bit of redundancy through these slides is that all of these androgen signaling inhibitors, uh, when compared to ADT alone, reduce the hazard for death by about 30 to 40 percent. Um, it's pretty consistent across studies. Stampede was 1,000 patients, randomized to ADT plus or minus abiraterone, um, similar reduction in the hazard for death by 40 percent. So when do I use abiraterone? First is when I'm looking for a cost-effective option. Um, abiraterone is generic. The copays co can still be a problem with that, but I Actually, in our clinic, we've had some luck with the Mark Cuban Cost Plus Pharmacy, and it's been helpful with transparent pricing for patients. Um, I also think about abiraterone in those rare situations where I'm planning or intending to cycle through multiple androgen signaling inhibitors. Um, there was a study from Kim Chi and colleagues published in 2019 that showed that there was better activity or PSA 50 responses after abiraterone than after enzalutamide. Um, I avoid abiraterone in patients with known cardiovascular disease. Again, not risk factors, but actual cardiovascular disease. So then the data that supports enzalutamide as a um, doublet for metastatic hormone-sensitive disease comes from the Enzimet um, and, oh man, uh, what's the other one? But So from the Enzimet trial and Arches is the other one. Um, and Enzimet randomized 1,100 patients to ADT plus 
basically bicalutamide versus ADT plus enzalutamide, and that's different there. You can see it's combined androgen blockade for the control arm, but again, you see a, about a 30% reduction in the hazard for death um, in favor of ADT plus enzalutamide. ARCHES was 1,100 patients randomized to ADT plus or minus enzalutamide, and you see a similar reduction in the hazard for death. So when do I use enzalutamide? I use enzalutamide when I'm trying to avoid steroids, uh, when I'm aiming for less cardiovascular toxicity, although there still is cardiovascular toxicity with enzalutamide, it's not like there's none here. I avoid enzalutamide in any patient with um, neurocognitive impairment um, or even just concerns that they're beginning to show any mild cognitive impairments or any history of seizures. So then apalutamide, so apalutamide is also a second generation AR antagonist, very similar to enzalutamide. Um, apalutamide was studied in the Titan trial where it significantly reduced the hazard for death by 35% compared to ADT alone. Um, that part gets pretty repetitive. Um, but where apalutamide is a bit different is you see there's lower risk for seizure, uh, very low risk for seizure. And then in my experience as well, there's less neurocognitive issues with apalutamide compared to enzalutamide, um, but that comes at a, you know, you're exchanging that for skin rash. Um, skin rashes are manageable, but they happen in about one in four patients, and it does add a little bit more burden um, to your clinic flow. So I use apalutamide when I want to use an AR antagonist with less neurotoxicity. Both apalutamide and enzalutamide can have a significant number of drug-drug interactions, um, particularly with DOACs. If so, if people have blood clots, that can be a major issue. And then the rash can be a bit of a nuisance for your clinic. So darolutamide has no current, it does not have a current role as a doublet, um, only as a triplet when given with chemotherapy, um, and that's from the Arison study. Darolutamide is structurally distinct from enzalutamide and apalutamide and is thought to have less neurocognitive issues um, due to less blood-brain barrier penetration. Uh, so I think it will be exciting once darolutamide is, uh, this Arisec trial reads out, and hopefully darolutamide will be approved um, as a doublet at that point, and it'll be a really exciting option for our patients. I touched upon this, I guess, the last talk before, uh, before we all got our break, but um, what's the role for radiation to the primary um, for these patients with metastatic hormone sensitive disease? Um, you know, most of this data, that for at least level one data, comes from the Stampede trial, which established radiation to the prostate as a standard of care for low volume metastatic disease by conventional imaging. Um, and that was, the Stampede trial looked at 2,000 men um, who were on a GnRH agonist or, uh, or antagonist randomized them to get radiation or just ADT alone. And you can see that um, there was no difference um, between the two arms for the overall cohort. Um, there was a planned post hoc analysis by volume of disease on conventional imaging. And in that planned post hoc analysis, there was evidence of treatment effect heterogeneity favoring the low volume cohort. And that's really been taken and ran with by the community, um, both academically in academic centers and beyond, um, where I think a lot of us are now doing radiation to the prostate for these patients with low volume disease. But there is equipoise around this question. Um, the HORAD trial looked at a very similar, or had a very similar design to Stampede, was also um, uh, negative for the overall cohort of unselected patients. And then in that one, subgroup analysis by volume, there was, it was inconclusive for the low volume subset. Um, the PEACE-1 trial is our latest addition to this, um, this space, and PEACE-1 looked at ADT plus abiraterone plus or minus radiation, so a more modern question using doublets, and it also saw no difference for radiation to the prostate. So I think there is more equipoise around the benefit of radiation to the prostate. And then I'll just finish up with, I think we, you know, men with metastatic disease live for a long time and we need to be ensure that we're caring for the whole patient. Um, and that has been touched upon very nicely by Dave and Scott Selinger and everybody. But we need to be monitoring cardiovascular disease, looking at lipid profiles, A1C. I'm doing that every six to 12 months and also calculating an ASCVD risk score um, and considering starting, starting statins accordingly. Um, we need to be monitoring bone health in these patients, uh, getting DEXAs at baseline in every one to three years thereafter. In the metastatic hormone sensitive space, 
Um, it's not a just it's not a pan recommendation if you have bone mets. It's more that if you have osteopenia and a high FRAC score, or if you have osteoporosis, then you're going to use a bone strengthening drug. And then uh, just you know, I think the prostate 360 concept is a really exciting one because it also layers these with things like, such as sexual health, neuropsychiatric health, and, and exercise. And this is really hard to touch upon all of that in one in one clinic visit. In conclusion, doublets with GnRH agonist or antagonist plus androgen signaling inhibitors are the standard of care for all men with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Understanding the disease and the whole patient um, guide the type of androgen signaling inhibitor that we use, the use of triplet therapy, the role of radiation to the prostate, and likely in the future treatment interruptions for eugonad survival. Thank you.